the normal here in the service, but that's okay, because that's a great problem to have. I, I love those children, love our youth. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we thank you for this time together here this morning. Just pray your blessing upon us as we look into this psalm. Uh, Father, help us to grab hold of those truths that you have for us. Help us to apply them to our hearts and our lives. And Father, just grow our faith here this morning as a result of what we learn together. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, we are going through some of the different psalms in the book of Psalms. And Psalm 46 has got to be one of my favorite psalms. It's right there at the top. And just so much appreciate that psalm. What a, what a wonderful psalm to grab hold of, even especially in days like this. Uh, there was a, a man by the name of Frank Gabelin who taught senior Bible. He's done a, such prolific work and scholarship and commentaries. And in fact, I have a set of commentaries, and he is the editor of the whole set of commentaries. But Frank Gabelin, um, if you go back in time, he taught a senior Bible class at a high school, Stony Brook S School in New York. And he was a deep-thinking, devout Christian who was serious about Bible memorization. In fact, it, he believed so much so in the benefit of memorization of the Bible and the scriptures that he made his, now get this, his senior class, those students in the senior Bible class, made them memorize over 300 Bible verses in that senior year. Well... More often than not, it was a common thing for Dr. Gablem to come in contact with a student on the way, and um, on, the, on his way to lunch. And when he ran into a student from his class on the way to, run, on the way to lunch, he would ask them to recite something like, like John uh, chapter 13, 34, and he would say, please recite that for me. And as you can probably understand, many of the students in that senior Bible class would make sure that they were peeling their eyes, looking for Dr. Gabelin. And when they saw him, they would take a roundabout route to the dining room. <laughs> Nobody wanted to run into Dr. Gabelin. <laughs> now, Christian author and pastor Gordon MacDonald, who was a student in Dr. Gabelin's class, decades later, Gordon MacDonald treasures the gift of that scripture memory in senior class in high school. And he writes these words, a few days ago, my doctor called me. Gordon, this is Dr. B. I have some difficult news for you. There's a tumor in the back of your head. In the lining of the brain. It's not malignant. You're not going to die from it, but it will have to come out. And that means surgery and some recuperative time in the next few months. And Dr. Or Gordon McDonald rather said these words, I have spent my whole life helping other people face doctor call moments like these. Now it was my turn, and as the doctor went through further details of my situation, the very first thing that began to surge through my mind, the very first thing was, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear he goes on to say, thanks to Dr. Gablin in Psalm 46, I may be concerned and cautious, but I want you to know I am not afraid. Wow. Psalm 46 is what we're looking at here today. I encourage you to grab your Bibles. I want to just read through this as we begin here this morning. Psalm 46, beginning uh, with the caption at the very top, to the choir master of the sons of Korah, according to the Alamoth, which is some musical note, uh, they believe. Here is a song. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. Verse 4, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Now verse 8. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. 
He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and the, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord is of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Don't you just love Psalm 46? Just a great, great passage. I'm not sure if you know some of the context behind Psalm 46. Well, not all scholars agree, many do, that this is connected with an attack on God's city, Jerusalem, in 701 B.C. Sennacherib and his Assyrian army are, are on the move. They're devouring nation after nation there in the, the Mediterranean area. Everything in their path is striking fear in all the people around them. We know something of King Sennacherib and Assyria and the, the kingdom as it was growing. And you see um, in this uh, map here, all the green around here, that was all of Syrian empire. And it just kept growing and growing. But you'll notice here that there was one little area within the green, and it was called the country of Judah. And then the country of Judah was the capital city, Jerusalem. So Assyria moved on and, and struck down nation after nation and king after king. There was one king that was still upright. <laughs> one king still standing among all the other fallen kings. And his name was Hezekiah. Right there is a, the, the arrow there is where Jerusalem is and where Jerusalem lies. And then Judah very, right next to it. It's interesting as you study some of the Assyrian uh, um, conquest, there's a lot that's going on. And a lot, you're going to understand why there was so much fear back then. You talk about an evil and wicked nation, Assyria fit the bill. <laughs> there's a relief. We have some reliefs and some artwork from that time. And you'll notice here, oops, oh boy, going too fast, too fast, too fast. Okay. Right here, you notice captives of war and how they're uh, actually shackled together by, by wooden uh, shackles, if you will, carried off back into Assyria. Then uh, another picture. Um, this is interesting. Again, gives you something of the feel for what must have been going on among the people there. But this is uh, the Assyrians actually um, with uh, placing hooks in the nose of their captives. And then here, this Assyrian is actually gouging the eyes out of one of the captives there. We go on, and you see, um, actually, in this uh, artwork, the Assyrians are cutting the tongues out of their captives uh, so they cannot talk back to them at all. And then in this one, in this relief, we see the Assyrians actually flaying alive the captives, after they brought them back from conquest. And you get a feel of how wicked, how utterly evil the Assyrians were. And as they made their way on this conquest, they come to Judah, the nation of Judah, and its capital city, Jerusalem, and they surround the city, this entire Assyrian army, and it's a big army, and we're going to look at this, the size of it here in just a little bit. And at that moment, King Hezekiah, who's in Jerusalem, he goes into the temple because he gets this letter from of the king of Assyria, and he takes it in the temple, lays it out before the Lord, cries his heart out to the Lord, and says, Lord, help. Can you imagine that? This Assyrian army surrounding this the city of Jerusalem, you're the king of the city, and you, hear, you know all this wickedness that's going on among the Assyrian army and, and the king of Syria, Sennacherib, and, and you're thinking, uh-oh, <laughs> we're next in line. You want to know what was in the letter that King Sennacherib sent to King Hezekiah? We find it over in Second Kings. This is what Sennacherib sent to King Hezekiah. Do not let your God in whom you trust deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. 
Behold, you have heard what the kings of Syria have done to all the lands, devoting them to destruction. And shall you be delivered? Yikes. That was the letter that, that King Hezekiah went into the temple of the Lord, fell down on his knees, cried his heart out, laid the letter out before the Lord, and asked God to help. <laughs> well, God heard Hezekiah's prayer, and that very night, the angel of the Lord comes and slays how many Assyrians were in the army? 185,000 Assyrians that the Lord struck down that night, answering Hezekiah's prayer. That is the background to Psalm 46. Isn't that interesting? When trouble comes, wow, we have a refuge we can run to, don't we? <laughs> when trouble comes, we have a God that we can turn to. When trouble comes, we know that we have a mighty God that will take care of us. I want you to see this. When we come to this whole issue of, of God and that refuge that we can turn to, we need to know that our God is a powerful refuge. You know, the Hebrew word for refuge means a quiet place for safety. A quiet place for sa safety. Hezekiah found his refuge in God in the temple as he laid his letter out, uh, Sennacherib's letter out, and poured his heart out to God. God is a refuge and strength, we are told, in verse 1, a very present help in trouble. When you see that word refuge, again, the Hebrew word for refuge it invokes a quiet place for safety. You got any quiet places you go to <laughs> when things get really, really difficult in your life? There's a quiet place that Hezekiah found, and it was in the temple of the Lord. It could be in your backyard. It could be in one of the rooms of your house. It could be anywhere, but a quiet place, a place of refuge. God is our refuge. He's the one that gives us strength. We also find something else out in this passage. God is also a nearby refuge, a nearby refuge. I want you to see this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You know, trouble is a word that needs no defining, right? <laughs> we all know what trouble is. It literally means in the Hebrew, narrow and tight space. A narrow and tight space. You ever been in a narrow and tight space before? I remember a few years ago, my mom was having issues with the toilet in her house. Um, and come to find out, the septic line underneath the house needed replaced. And unfortunately... Underneath the house was a crawl space <laughs> and not a basement. And I'm telling you, you did the, the belly crawl. That's what I did, belly crawl. <laughs> and I'm going about, what, 30 feet back in, uh, in this crawl space. And I'm seeing signs of mice. And I'm seeing bugs crawling. And I'm saying, I want to get out of here as quick as I can. <laughs> But there's hardly any, any room to move, and, and your elbows, you couldn't even hardly pick them up. And so I got that job done. I got it done in a hurry. <laughs> and so a tight space when the author of Psalm 46 says there's this trouble going on in life, he had in mind a tight space. Space, space with not a whole lot of movement. But I want you to see this also. Very present. A very present help in trouble. Very present conveys the idea that God is easy to find. Isn't that awesome? God is easy to find. He, he's omnipresent. He's always with us. I love this. Uh, the, these, some of these passages. God's forever our refuge. Therefore we will not fear though the earth gives way. Though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. Did you notice what the psalmist is saying here? <laughs> He's talking about the earth, the mountains, and the sea. And, and when he brings up the earth, the mountains, and the sea, we come to find out that, hey, those are the most ancient things in our lives, right? <laughs> the mountains have been there. The earth has been there since creation. The sea has been there since creation. And you go on 
The rest of the verse, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. The psalmist is talking about those things that have been there for a long, long time. But guess who was there before those things? God, who is our refuge. You know, the earth, mountains, and sea are the most ancient things to our senses, but God is ageless. He was before them. He created them. He's from everlasting. He's eternal. So God is our forever refuge, and we can take great comfort in knowing that God is a strong refuge. God is a, a forever refuge. God is one who is easy to find. Aren't you thankful? Well, when trouble comes, do you know you have a hidden strength within you because of who you know, because of this refuge that we have? Look at Psalm 46 again. And I want you to see this. There is a river, verse 4, we'll look at it in just a second again. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, a holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Interesting, I think what's going on here is a reference to something that was happening in the city. Do you know Hezekiah had a hidden water tunnel in the city? I've seen it. We've been to Israel. We've looked at it before. There was a hidden water tunnel there. There was a spring just outside the city gates, not too far. And then there was this hidden water tunnel, and Hezekiah had the foresight to have his people carve out a tunnel through and underneath the city gates into the city from the spring that was outside the city. The tunnel was 1,749 feet long. They carved this out of rock. How did they do it? I don't know. But he had the foresight to know that if they ever got surrounded by an enemy, and what happened so many times back then, they would surround the city, they would cut off all the water, cut off all the food, because nobody could get out. They stayed in. They kept in there for a long time until they finally gave up. It's either starve to death or give in to the enemy. It's either die of thirst or give in to the enemy. So Hezekiah's hidden water tunnel... I think is being referenced here in Psalm chapter 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Isn't that interesting? Here's another cutaway of what it might have looked like, Hezekiah's hidden water tunnel. Um, But again, 1,749 feet through solid rock. We have, and I want to remind you this, as a believer in Christ, we have strength from within because of who lives in us. There is a river, there it is again, whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of God. John chapter 4 reminds us of a symbolism of water in the Bible. It's all through scripture. Jesus said to her, to the woman at the well, remember the story? He came there, the woman comes to the well. She's seeking water. Jesus says, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never thirst again. The water I give him will become a a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus was talking about the fact that as a believer in Christ, we can have that new life with Christ, and we can have that Holy Spirit living within us, and we can enjoy a life of joy, a life of abundance, a life of continual strength. There's something else I bring to your attention. We have a person who abides within. We're told in verses 5 through 7, God is in the midst of her, that's speaking of Jerusalem. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. What happened when the people woke up the next morning? They saw all the slain bodies the 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian army lying dead, scattered across the landscape. When they got up, they realized that God did help them in the morning dawn. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, and the earth melts. We have a person who abides within us. We have God Almighty in the Holy Spirit abiding in us as believers in Christ, and we are blessed. Amen? (laughs) 
The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. By the way, you'll see Selah come up three times in this passage. Or in the, yeah, in the Psalm 46, verses 1 to 3. Then a Selah at the end of that section, verses 4 to 7. A Selah at the end of that section. Verses 8 to 11, a Selah at the end of that section. Psalm 46 divides beautifully into three major sections. And that Selah means, hey, just stop. Slow down a minute. Think about what you just read. <laughs> That's what it means. Think about that. Think about the, the God that we serve. Think about the God who is our fortress. So the Lord of hosts is with us. And as believers in Christ, we have the blessing of God with us. Remember the story of Daniel and the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? They were thrown into the fiery furnace. Remember that? And then the king notices there is a fourth person in there, angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ was there with them in the furnace. The three men did not get burned up. They survived the fire because of who was with them. Psalm 139, one of, another one of my favorite psalms, where shall I go from your spirit? David says, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. You know, God is with us. He's with us. And as believers in Christ, he now lives within us. If I take the wings of the morning, David goes on to say, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. That is great news, isn't it? That's news of great hope that we have as believers in Christ. By the way, my daughter is here this morning, but I thought of this even, even before I knew she was going to be here. This is my daughter out in California. Remember that, Bethany? She's doing some cave kayaking. She was at a camp in California for the summer. I went there, totally enjoyed the experience. I remember it was a little bit rough going at the beginning. She got there. Her roommate wasn't there yet. It was dark. She was hundreds of miles from home. And mom and dad were a little concerned. Yeah, there were a few tears. <laughs> and Bethany, she was ready to come back home, I think. <laughs> but I still remember sharing this. Psalm 46. And the fact that, Bethany, you see those stars in the sky right now? <laughs> those are the very same stars that we're seeing here in Indiana in many respects. But you know what? Those stars were created by the very same God that loves us. And even though you're hundreds of miles away, and it's a little difficult right now, we serve a God that is with us. Well, little did I know that the experience in the caves became interesting and kayaking out in the ocean was interesting because then Bethany told us after the fact that these are one of the most shark-infested waters off the state of California. I was thinking, <laughs> Bethany! <laughs> So, aren't you thankful that we have a God that loves us? Aren't you thankful that we have a God that's with us? <laughs> aren't you thankful that we have a God that knows us deeply? And he was watching over our daughter. Romans chapter 8. In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for. The Spirit, Spirit himself intercedes for us through worldly or wordless groans. And he searches our hearts and knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. We have the Holy Spirit living within us. When trouble comes, we're going to close out with this. We must do these things. Two things. Are you ready? When trouble comes your way, here they are. Number one, remember the acts of the Lord. Look at verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations in the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. 
God is an awesome God, isn't he? We need to remember his acts. We need to remember what he has done in the history of our people. We need to remember what he's done in our own lives. Are you journaling any? I know a few weeks ago, I encourage you and challenge you to start journaling. As you go through your devotions, write down those things that God reminds you of. As you go through your devotions, then write down the things that God does for you, the prayers that he answers for you. Journaling is a great way to remember the acts of the Lord. Number two, and we're done. Be still before the Lord. Now, this is probably the hardest of all, isn't it? How many of you are good at being still? (laughs) Being still is so hard because in this culture of ours, everything is fast, isn't it? (laughs) And if something's not fast, we're, we're so frustrated. I was so frustrated when I went to Cross 31 this last week. Zoom cars, zoom cars, zoom. I just wanted to get home. And I waited and I waited. It seemed like I waited for five hours, but it wasn't five hours. <laughs> it was maybe a minute. But the cars just kept coming and coming. And we're so used to this quick paced life, right? But God says, Be still before me. Be still. Be still. The picture is you're quiet, you're still, and behind all that is you are, you ready for this? Trusting. You're trusting God to work in your life. You're trusting God to unfold and continue to unfold as well. You're trusting God as the one who is your refuge. And because of that, you can be still and wait upon him. Be still before the Lord. Be still and know that I am God, we are told in Psalm 46, 10 to 11. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our... Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful for the God that we serve? Aren't you thankful for the God who is our refuge? Aren't you thankful that we have a God that we can trust in in times of trouble? Musicians, come and close us out this morning.